Hi and welcome to lesson 5 in our final biology topic under the microscope where today we're going to be looking at mud and soil and looking at how it is able to change what's in it and how uh, living organisms can actually help with it. Okay, so here are our objectives for our lesson on soil. By the end of this lesson you should understand what the chemical and biological content of soil is. Soil is a mixture of various different things. It contains mineral particles. It contains humus, which is dead and decaying plants and animal material. It also contains air or pockets of air. Alongside water. And living organisms. Now, if a soil is fertile, it will have lots of air spaces in order to provide oxygen for the living organisms as they need that oxygen to be able to respire. Now, there are different types of soil. There is sandy soil, which contains large mineral particles. There's clay soil, which contains small mineral particles. And then there's loam, which contains a mixture of clay and sand. Now, plants obviously grow in soil and they need a variety of things within that soil. Firstly, they need minerals such as nitrates and phosphates to help them with growth and various other processes. They also need water for photosynthesis and transpiration. The final thing is they need the soil for anchorage to hold the plants upright. Now the humus it releases minerals through decomposition and this is essential in order to provide a fertile soil. Now there are obviously three main parts to the, uh, to the soil that you can try to work out the, the measurements for. The first one we're going to look at is the air in a soil sample. So if we look at how we do this, first of all we put a soil sample into a measuring cylinder. Then we add it all the way up to the 100 centimeter cubed mark. So we've got a total volume in here of 100 centimeter cubed. We then put a lid on, shake it up and down and what that will do is the air bubbles that are in the soil will then be released. Now, we then record or look at the new level of the water in the, beak, in the measuring cylinder and at the initial reading minus the new volume is the volume of air in the soil. Now this method might not be completely accurate as when you initially add the water to the soil, some of that water may go into some of those air spaces. Now the second method is for looking at the water content in soil. The first thing you do is you weigh and record a mass of the soil sample. You then heat in an oven for about 24 hours and that will evaporate the water. Then you re-weigh the soil and heat for a further 24 hours and repeat. And you need to keep doing this until there is no further loss. So each time you're doing this, you're heating in the oven, you are evaporating the water and removing that water. Now, as soon as you get that level leveling off, it means that you've got no more water to evaporate. Now, in order to find the humus content, you need to take the sample from the previous one, from the completely dried um, soil sample, and you need to heat it with a Bunsen burner and what this will do is it will incinerate the humus. You can then weigh the sample. Now you continue to do this until you've got no further loss. And you've got your initial mass minus the mass of after the burning will give you your mass of humus. Now as we've seen in the first experiment we, we've just looked at where we're looking at the air content of soil, one of the problems was that the air spaces can fill up with water. Now, if this happens outside in the wild, 
then we can actually get what we call water logging and this is where the water fills up the air spaces and removes the oxygen now obviously the particle size and the air content um, sorry the particle size can affect the air content within the soil so the larger the particle size the larger the air spaces so if you've got big clay sorry sandy um, soil then you're going to get very big water spaces so that can actually fill up very quickly it also allows the water to pass through very quickly so sandy soils which is often why you have sports pitches which have very sandy soils so that they can remove that water very quickly now if you want to get more oxygen into the soil what you can do is you can push holes into the soil to aerate it now this can also help with the drainage of the soil as well now soils are also naturally acidic now a lot of organisms can't survive in acidic conditions now plants also need to absorb minerals from the soil so farmers often treat it with lime which is a calcium compound to help neutralize it now that isn't lime as in the fruit now earthworms are extremely important for soil they provide several things that they can actually help fertilize the, or make the soil more fertile the first one the burrowing mixes the layers of soil together now that burrowing also can create air channels and aeration they can also drag dead leaves other organic matter into their burrows which can then be decomposed by bacteria and fungi they can also neutralize acidic soil now the fungi and the bacteria actually break down the organic matter and it provides more nutrients for the plants to take in and it was Charles Darwin that actually said that the mixing of the layers and the moving of the material for, uh, for the decomposition which provides more nutrients uh, was actually caused by earthworms and it also prevents the nutrients from being washed away because they're taken down lower okay so to conclude what we have looked at we've looked at a couple of methods of how we can actually um, uh, look at what the material is in soil we've looked at what the material is in soil with its um, minerals humus which is the dead and decaying uh, living and plant uh, sorry animal and plant material uh, we've also looked at the role earthworms can play in helping make soil a little bit more fertile than it actually is. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this and I will see you another time. Bye-bye.